I do encourage you, there are some devotional books on the back table as we're beginning a new book. Uh, Paul's letter to the Corinthians. A lot of real practical challenges that apply to the church, especially today, I would say even today, especially today. The city of Corinth was quite a wicked city. Uh, in fact, if you would go there today to the archaeology museum, uh, and I had the privilege of going there about 10 years ago and see some of the statues and things that are there, uh, it was a pretty vile society. And yet this church was in the middle of the society, and Paul was challenging them to live pure and holy before God. And we're going to re be reminded of these lessons because we live in really a quite vile and awful generation. And yet that doesn't lessen God or his power or his strength or what the Holy Spirit can do through us. Because these truths are just as powerful today as they were almost 2,000 years ago. If I were to ask you what is the best car company, I would probably have some disagreements among you as church members. I grew up in the Detroit area. Now, if you grow up in the Detroit area, almost for sure that either you or your friends have parents that work in some way with the car companies. Uh, my family, my dad worked for, it was AMC first, and then they were bought out by Jeep and Chrysler. He eventually worked for Chrysler uh, at the time. And uh, my uncle worked for Ford. Uh, my grandpa and grandma on my mom's side worked for GM. Uh, so with the big three, there's these associations that go on, and there's always the question, what's better? Um, we weren't big Ford fans growing up. I'm not sure why not, because my grandparents on my dad's side were very big Ford fans. But, of course, we'd always use the acrostic found on the road dead for Fords. Uh, to, to me, all, in all honesty, I didn't really care what kind of car I had as long as it ran and didn't give me a lot of problems. Because I have had pretty much every type of car and some have been really good and others have been really bad and all been from all different companies. But people have gotten into arguments over what's the best model of car and people will still do that. Even the fact growing up there were times fights, almost family divisions would occur over these type of what is the best vehicle. And it was very similar in the early church, except they weren't fighting over vehicles. They were fighting over spiritual leaders, but yet it was just as foolish of an argument. Paul had visited the city of Corinth on his missionary journey, his second missionary journey. And I just want to give you a, a brief uh, idea of where Corinth is. To get a bearing on where we're at, um, my pointer, laser pointer, is not working. I'm going to need a do, new battery here. Hmm. Oh, there we go. I get it. Right here is Israel. So that's the area of Israel. Uh, today, uh, in those days, this was the area of Asia, uh, Galatia, Cappadocia, and over here was Macedonia with the KI, and right here would be Corinth. Now today, if you want to relate this, this is modern-day Turkey. This is modern-day Greece over here, where Corinth is. Now Corinth was known for uh, having basically, today they have a canal that actually connects this, which you look at the map and say, well, that's not a big deal. They could just sail around that. But in those days, to sail around there when you don't have motors um, and you relied on the wind often took several extra days, if not months, because it was 250 miles if you wanted to sail around here to go up to and then over here would have been like Italy. So to make this trek, if you were leaving anywhere here and wanted to go over to Rome, 
you would have to go all the way around here, which again, for us, doesn't seem like a big deal. But in those days, you're talking maybe a month's travel. So what they would do in Corinth is there was a very short spot. They had tried to connect the, the land and to dig out a canal, and that wasn't really finished till the late 1800s. But what they would do is they would actually take their boat, and they had roller systems that they would take their large cargo boats, and they would basically use animals and pull them on like logs, and they would roll them across. By the way, don't ever let people tell you that we are so much smarter in our generation, in our day and age, than they were in ancient times. Because what they were able to do in ancient times to move things and build things and do things was amazing without the equipment that we have today. And so they were able to do that. Because of that, it was a large source. Uh, the, the city of Corinth was a place where a lot of people would travel through. And almost the idea we would get the idea of a large truck stops today uh, would be that picture. And in that would also introduce a lot of sailors who were often very vile men stuck out on the oceans for, for months at a time. And as they would come through here and stop and all the partying and different things that went with it. That was kind of the picture of the city of Corinth. Paul begins his letter, and he gives a short greeting, and if you were reading your devotional book uh, or reading through this week, you kind of read through some of that. But after that greeting, he gets right to the point. He doesn't waste a lot of time, and he gets to the point about the difficulties that the Corinthian church was having. The first thing we see this morning is that there should not be division in the church. Verse 10 of 1 Corinthians 1. I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. He appeals to them by Jesus Christ that they agree, that they be of the same mind. Remember a few weeks ago, the prayer of Jesus in John chapter 17, what did he pray? He prayed that they would all be one. Now understand the idea of being one doesn't mean that we all think exactly the same thing. Being of the same mind doesn't mean that everybody thinks exactly like us. Now sometimes we want to get the idea, if everybody thought exactly like me, the world would be a better place. <laughs> Maybe not. Uh, maybe it would be a worse place if everybody thought exactly like you. But we are all different and we are all unique and we have all our own special personalities that, that we have our likes and dislikes and things appeal to us and things don't appeal to us. So he's not saying that we should all be like robots and all like exactly the same thing and not like the certain things. Because we're all different. But to understand that we can be of the same mind even though we're all different and have all different personal preferences. One of the main keys to being of the same mind is to have a general agreement on the same rules, the same structure. And when it comes down to a church, the way we can be unified is not to focus on the things the Bible doesn't say. Most of the time churches are divided, most of the time churches are split, is because they make a big deal about things that the Bible doesn't directly say. I mean, the Bible gives certain declarations of what sin is and what sin isn't. I mean, certain things he talks about, the idea of lying and fornication and some of these other things are clearly sin before God, and we shouldn't have a part of them. But there are other things that are not directly mentioned in Scripture and really sometimes not even referred to, that, and those are the things often that cause the most arguments and fighting, and often it is caused over personal preference. 
It is the idea of splitting because you like Ford and I like Chevy, so we just can't get along together. Now, that's maybe what the world does, but as believers, it doesn't matter to me if you like Ford or Chevy or GM. I've had all of them. In fact, right now I have a Toyota, I have a Saturn, I have a GM, and uh, we have a Chrysler. You know, we have all types of, of different things. It doesn't matter to me. But yet in the church, what times do we get arguing over what it looks like? Oh, no, you know, we've, we've moved some pews in the back, and I don't like it. I liked it when they were back on the right side, and, and I think they should be on this side because it just doesn't seem right to be on the other side. And there's little things like that, and it sounds kind of foolish, but things like that, the churches and people split over and argue and blow up and to get into big arguments, and the Bible doesn't address it. And here Paul says, look, I want you to be of the same mind. And he explains to them what they were doing, the problem they were having, and what they should focus on. You see, the Corinthians were divided by which leader they followed. Now, if you think that is uh, a problem they used to have in those days, believe me, it's not. It happens in the secular world today. You know, are you a Democrat or a Republican or who you follow? This is, you know, so you argue and you fight over these things because this is the leader we follow. Oh, we follow this leader. And it comes into the church. A lot of churches will argue that over. Well, not even political leaders that I mentioned, but even like people, spiritual leaders. Well, I like this preacher and I like this preacher. Nothing wrong with that. But it's not a a point of argument. Look what he says in verse 11. For it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there is quarreling among you, my brothers. What I mean is that each one of you says, I follow Paul, or I follow Apollos, or I follow Cephas, or some say, I follow Christ. So he's using this example. What happened in the church is that there were a group of people to say, well, we're following the teachings of Paul. And somebody else says, no, 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 we're following the teachings of Apollos. If you remember when we went through the book of Acts, we talked about Apollos being a great speaker. He was a powerful speaker. He's the type that everybody would like to listen to. Others are like, well, I follow Peter because he was the rock on which the church built. And others, and maybe this was rightfully so, but some of them maybe in a prideful way say, well, I follow Christ. I'm not going to follow these men. And Paul is saying, look, you guys are arguing over which leader you follow. And the point that he's making here is that these are just men. They shouldn't be followed. It's not like I can buy into everything that this man has to say. And I see it today in Christianity in certain circles that there are uh, what you would kind of call bigwig leaders in Christianity. And a lot of them are very humble servants of God. But yet what happens is a group really likes this person and how they speak and they jump on the bandwagon. Basically anything that this pastor or preacher says to them is more important than anything else any other pastor or preacher says. And it's easy for us to people worship. I mean we see this in our society today. When a sports leader stands up and says some political statement that it makes headline news. You know, LeBron James says that this is what the government should do. So everybody thinks, oh, because he's a great basketball player and eight foot or seven foot tall, we should listen to the guy. You know, and it's like, well, what in the world? I mean, he didn't even go to college. He went right to, ba- to, to um, basketball, professional basketball, right from high school. And though when somebody says something, we tend to worship people. And Paul says, look, that shouldn't be the case. Instead, what needs to happen is Christ needs to be your focus. Verse 13, is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, so that none of you say you were baptized by me. 
I did baptize also the household of Stephanus, but beyond that, I don't know whether I baptized anyone else. Paul says it doesn't matter if you followed me, came to Christ because of me, or because of Apollos, or because of Cephas, because of Peter. That doesn't matter. Why? Verse 17, for Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with eloquent words of wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. He said it is the power of the gospel. It is the power of the word of God. It's not about what leader or how a leader has to say it. Because in reality, I could have six different speakers come up, and they could all share something, and probably every one of you would say, oh, that person spoke to me. And it wasn't that person. God simply used the Holy Spirit through that person's personality, and it really touched you. Funny example, even this week, my, uh, uh, my wife watched one of the chapel messages. They had a, a speaker um, uh, at Cedarville University where my son goes. And my wife watched one of the chapel messages, and she thought this was such a good message. So she texted my son. She said, I, did you like that chapel message? I thought it was really just great. And my son responds, too emotional for me. And that's all he says. <laughs> my wife thought it was just the greatest thing in the world. And my son's like, ah, it was just all, seemed to be all emotion. And as he, she watched that, they watched the same speaker. And my wife and my son responded two complete different ways. Now, ultimately, the point is, it's the Word of God that changes people, but yet God uses different people that can touch us and reach us in different ways. And Paul says, look, it's not about me. I'm just sharing. Apollos is sharing. Peter's sharing. And we're sharing about Christ. When I was in high school, one of our teachers took us to uh, Coney Island down in Detroit. And you go to this Coney Island, and there's two Coney Islands next to each other. And as you go to this Coney Island, what they would do is they would fight for you to be their customer. And one of them would say, oh, come on in my place because this place, you know, they, they don't cook their dogs as well as we do. Or they don't have the same quality of hot dogs. And they would kind of fight to argue to get in their door. And it was really a kind of neat experience. So we picked one of the restaurants, and afterwards my teacher said, do you realize that both of these restaurants are owned by the same owner. And he, sa he says, they have all the exact same items in the restaurant. And he says, they just do it to try to, this ploy to make you say that theirs is better or not to try to draw people in. And it was just kind of a funny, humorous thing. But sometimes we, as a church, oh, you don't want to go to that church because of this and that. And yeah, you got to go here because of the, whatever reason. When they're all under and owned by Christ. Now, I am not saying that every church is preaching the gospel. Scripture makes it very clear that there are false teachers, and there are abounding in this area false teachers who don't teach the true gospel. But ultimately, when you have people that are teaching the gospel, maybe it's not necessarily your flair or your personality or the way you want it. It's the Word of God that makes a difference. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because there should be no boasting in human power. The ultimate source of the true power is the cross of Jesus Christ. Verse 18. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Paul is letting the people know and reminding the people know it's not about human wisdom or human power because the world often thinks that the cross is kind of foolish. Oh, you people that have faith, you have to hold on to something. You have to have a crush, uh, crutch for, for something in life. They think it's foolish, which sadly most of these people are often miserable. And here it says the world thinks it's folly. But it is the power of the cross, the message of Jesus Christ, the message of God's word. Because there's great wisdom in God's word, but the wisdom of this world is foolishness to God. Look at verse 19. 
For it is written, Paul quotes the Old Testament to say this is not a new idea. I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? Philosophy, human reasoning is without God, is without morals, it's without absolutes. It's just foolish. And we live in a world that wants to put aside absolutes and basically say the truth is what you want to make it to be, but yet you have to believe my truth and the, my version of the truth. There's no absolutes. People make up their own rules, and it ultimately is foolishness where the wisdom of God is truth that has been around from generation to generation that does not change. Sometimes I'm dumbfounded from what I hear on the news about people who are supposed to be smart. People are supposed to be doctors. People have these degrees. And they will say things, and you're like, what in the world? That is just such a foolish statement. And yet they are proclaimed as to be all these wonderful, wise people, and yet it's so simple that even kids and children can understand and see past it. Verse 21 says, For since in wisdom the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. He says the foolishness, which he's not really calling the, the gospel foolishness. He's kind of being kind of overbearing on this. It's the simplicity of the gospel. It's not complex. The fact that Jesus came to die on the cross for your sin to bring you life, it's not this great, deep, complex thing that people have a hard time figuring out. It's this simple spot, this simple understanding. Understanding God is not complex. In fact, we're told, uh, uh, David says, I have more understanding than all my teachers, for your testimonies are my meditation. The Word of God is the source of real, true wisdom and understanding. I remember growing up, and our church was very picky about many things. At least this was my perspe- uh, 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 This is what I perceived. And it was often talked about, well, that church, if they're not part of our specific group, they're no good. Or, oh, you can't listen to that speaker on the radio because they're no good. And would. But yet when I would start to listen to certain speakers who just simply preach the word of God, I was blown away. Because I would hear the more, more of the word of God there than I ever heard at the church where I was growing up. Because a lot of the times I felt and believed that a lot of times the church I grew up in, they spent a lot of time stating their opinions about everything opinion about what the Bible had to say rather than simply what the Bible had to say. That's where this true source of wisdom comes. That's where the true source of power comes from. Verse 22. For the Jews demand a sign and the Greeks seek wisdom. The Jews were always looking for a miraculous. The Greeks were always looking for something deep and profound and all these big words they could use and uh, to be smarter than the other person. Paul says that's not what the gospel's about. He says, verse 23, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and folly to the Gentiles. We preach the word of Jesus Christ and what he did. He was the Messiah that came, paid the price for our sin. The, many of the Jews don't get it, and they stumble. The idea of a stumbling block. You would find this over in Israel especially. But today, if you think about it, when you go somewhere, let's say if you go to uh, a store somewhere and they have a little step, what do they have to do with that step? Have big yellow paint on it. So that way you don't stumble on it. The idea in those days in Israel was there were rocks and places, but many times these rocks would kind of shift up and be that rock that would be like that stumbling block that you'd catch your toe on. 
here the Jews would trip over it because they wanted all these signs and miraculous things that, that um, they were looking for more than the simplicity of the gospel. The Greeks were looking for all these advanced different philosophies that just people kind of outthink themselves. We have that today where people try to outthink themselves and they basically become foolish because they try to put all these thoughts and it doesn't make sense. Verse 24, But to those who are called, both Jews and Greek, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God, for the foolishness of God is wiser than men, the weakness of God is stronger than men. If God had a foolish spot, if God had a weak spot, it would still be greater than men. Ultimately, what God wants is God wants us to boast in him. Verse 26, For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you are wise according to the worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. Look around you. Who in this room would you consider great? Maybe you say, well, look at me, you know. <laughs> you know, maybe you'd say that. The reality is, if we look around us, we're all pretty much average, ordinary people. We don't have all these degrees. We don't have all this money. Maybe you do. I don't know, but... We don't have all of these things. God uses the simple ones of the world, us. We don't have to have all this education. We don't have to have the money. We don't have to have this certain thing. Is God uses the simple things. Why? Verse 29, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. Understand, really, you're just a nobody. I'm a nobody, but that's that's great. That's so opposite of today's thinking. Today's thinking is that you got to be a somebody. Jesus says you have to be a nobody. You humble yourself, become a servant, and that's where I will exalt you. And to realize we're nobody, but that's the wonderful thing: is the power I have, the strength I have, the wisdom I have. It all comes from God. So no flesh of glory in his presence, verse 30, and because of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became wisdom from God, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption, so that as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. What you have, God has given it to you. And he is the one who should be exalted. Lastly, we see that there should be no trusting in human wisdom or in the wisdom of men. The phrase today, I believe in science, has become very popular. You will see this on signs, I believe in science. It's kind of scary because science is always changing. Science constantly changes what is so-called science. Now, true science is actually something that is observable, repeatable, and can be done over and over and over today. That's what true science is. But what people call science today, I believe in science, is thing that is constantly changing. I don't want to declare I believe in science because I believe in God. Now, I believe he's given us scientific principles. I don't believe the Bible is an unscientific book. In fact, it gives many profound truths about scientific details that are amazing. But we trust in the wisdom of men, but the wisdom of men constantly changes. Paul reminds us, that lives are not changed through fancy speeches. I'm going to skip some of these verses, but basically in verses 1 through 5, he says, when I came to you, I came with simple words. I didn't come as this great speaker who everybody loves to hear. I came preaching the simple truth of the gospel. By the way, sometimes we get scared when we try to share our faith because what if I say the wrong thing? Paul says it really doesn't matter. I'm just coming. It's not about my great words. I just want to share with you what God has done for me. And lives are changed through the wisdom of God. Verse 6 says of chapter 2, Yet among the mature we do impart wisdom. 
although it's not a wisdom of this age, that the rulers of this age who are doomed to pass away. What he says is the Bible, it's not that the Bible is not profound or deep or just all made for simpletons who will never understand it. No. What he's saying is it is God who reveals the truth. The words of God are deep. And yet at the same time, they're understandable, not by our power, but by the Holy Spirit that comes and works in us. And that's where we see that the wisdom of God is revealed through the Holy Spirit. Verse 10, these things God has revealed to us through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. Who knows the person's thought except the spirit of the person which is in him? So also no one can comprehend the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. Unbelievers don't have this. Verse 14, the natural person does not accept the things of the spirit for they are folly to him. Unbelievers can't understand what we understand because we have the Holy Spirit. It's not because of us that we can understand it. It is because the power working in us. And we ultimately have the ability to have the mind of Christ. Look at verse 15. The spiritual person judges all things, but in his himself to be judged by no one. For who has understood the mind of the Lord is to instruct him. But we have the mind of Christ. We have the ability to know what God wants, not in and of ourselves, through the Holy Spirit revealing through God's word. In conclusion, I want you to ask yourself these questions. First, are you helping divide or unite the church? Now understand, there are things that I wish the Bible said. There are certain things, I'll be honest with you. I wish the Bible declared that nose rings especially the big nose rings that stick out like a hoop i wish god said that was sin because to me i think they look nasty but you know there's some people who really like them some people who think they look great now i wish the bible said that now please don't understand if you really want to get one uh, the bible doesn't say it i just because my opinion that's my opinion because some people love them And there are lots of things that I have an opinion about that I wish God said was wrong because I want to tell you it's wrong because then I don't have to see it. But you know what? That's my opinion. But I kind of grew up in a Christian realm that if if that was looked down on it, oh, if you're a woman and you put a nose ring like that, you're you're basically they'd be called a whore. They would I mean from the pulpit, I would hear these things. And what happens is it's the opinion of man placed for biblical truth, and therefore you have a bunch of people believing that this opinion of man is equal to the Word of God, and that's where you have all the divisions because people are arguing over these things that are not biblical. Now, you might take some obscure Old Testament reference that says that talks about an earring because slaves would often have to get earrings and to say well this wasn't good and this was a mark of a slave but if you're going to try to try to argue by the old testament that means you also have to stone your children when they speak back to you i don't know if anybody wants to do that uh you know because i can't just follow one and can't follow the other The idea is scripture makes it very clear what is wrong and what is right so that everything else is really just opinion. Now, does that mean if my daughter came to me and she wanted a nose ring that I would say, oh, go ahead, no problem. I would really discourage her from it. (laughs) You know, well, when you get 18, you can uh, just like a cat. I don't want to have a cat. I don't want to have a dog. But when you go and get your own house, you can have a cat, you can have a dog. Just because I don't like them doesn't mean that they're wrong or right. And here when it comes down, and this is so important, uh, personal preference in those days equated to what was the word of God, and that's what causes division. Where we can have the same mind because what's really important is what the word of God states clearly and directly. Secondly, are you trusting in your human power? 
Do you look down on other people because you seem that you are smarter or better or stronger? Or are you trusting in human wisdom or logic and all these things that uh, human arguments? It's only because of Jesus Christ. And lastly, do you have the mind of Christ? How do you get the mind of Christ? If I want to know how somebody thought, what do I need to do? I have to study that person. What did they write? What did they say? How did they act? How did they live? You can have the mind of Christ. You have the Holy Spirit who gives you illumination to understand God's word. As you study God's word, you can have the mind of Christ. Through the working of the Holy Spirit, through the understanding of the tremendous word that God has given us. I want everyone to bow your heads and close your eyes as the musicians come forward to prepare for um, our closing song here. Let God speak to your heart and mind this morning.